So first off, we're gonna talk about how much coding do you really need in a statistics degree? So like I said, I'm gonna break that down by my degree, what types of programs we used, what percentage is actually programming and what percentage is actually just putting something in a software that makes it nice and easy click and point for you. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare that to my data, uh, I'm gonna compare that to my data intern internship where you know I have to do a lot of coding, I have to build dashboards, I have to do a bunch of different things, but I'm also using these softwares that are point and click. So I'm gonna break down how the statistics major compares to my data internship. So in my actual statistics major, um, there's quite a few classes that involve a lot of coding or at least some type of software. So bringing this down by my classes, the classes I've used for R were intro to R, ANOVA, regression, machine learning, my statistics capstone class, um, intro to Python, as well as SAS. So that's eight classes that involve a lot of a lot of coding. So out of those eight classes that involve a lot of coding, um, many of those use R. I would say about 90% of those classes that I'm taking that involve coding use R. Now obviously intro to Python is all Python, and then intro to SAS is all SAS. Um, but the intro to SAS class was a one credit course. It was super easy uh, in terms of like workload, though I do not like SAS. Um, but then intro to Python was more of a computer science S class. We weren't focused on data, uh, data analysis or data science in that. However, with my other classes, intro to R, we're learning basic data manipulation, basic data visualizations, um, just kind of how to use R from the ground up. And then after that, you're supposed to be taking some classes in ANOVA, in regression, and so in ANOVA and regression, you're looking at analysis of variance, you're fitting regression models, whether it's linear regression or logistic reg regression. There's all different types of regression that you're gonna learn in that class, but that's more, not so much coding as it is kind of just using pre-built functions to fit models. And we're just using R as a tool there so that we can do it a lot simpler than doing it by hand because that would be nearly impossible for some of the data sets you have to work with, right? Um, and then in machine learning in the data science course that I took, you have to learn a lot more about actually manipulating data in R. Even though you get a decent idea in the intro to R, uh, there, it goes into a lot more depth. So you're gonna have to do a lot of data cleaning to, uh, before you even try to fit a model. And that's something you learn in that class is that data cleaning and data manipulation is one of the most important steps in machine learning. Without that, your models are going to be absolutely terrible. They're not gonna perform well. Um, and you're, you're not gonna have any idea why, but it all goes into data cleaning. So Things like getting rid of NAs, um, transforming zeros if they don't make sense, transforming the NAs into zeros maybe if they don't make sense, or you might just have to remove them altogether. Uh, you're also going to get an idea of kind of how to manipulate your data into a training test or a training set and a test set, which is another important concept for machine learning. Um, but then in my capstone, which is kind of like it's supposed to culminate everything you've learned in your statistics major into one class. Uh, but what we do there is we focus on doing statistical tests um, and you can kind of use whatever program you want. That's not what the class is about, but the class is about communicating your results, um, you know, in a way that people are going to understand, even if they are statistics majors. So that's a super, another super important part of um, being able to code is being able to make sense of your code and then ultimately being able to make sense of your analysis and your models that you fit. Because when you're working in a job, you're going to have to. You're going to absolutely have to be able to explain that to somebody who doesn't understand it. Because um, in my experience, working with managers, um, they're, you know, they're great. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean they're not good managers, but they don't understand statistics like um, you have going through the entire major. And then, like I said, with Python and SAS, that was more so learning those programs specifically. We weren't doing data analysis of those. We were just kind of learning how to do them, which I think is another valuable resource because um, at least from my experience between R and Python, there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, I mean, a lot of the concepts are the same. You're gonna have a little bit different syntax when you're doing different things. But if you know R, you can learn Python pretty easily and then vice versa. SAS, however, on the other hand is, um, it seems outdated to me, but I think that's just because I don't know it. It's um, kind of difficult to learn, especially if you already know Python and R or maybe even any other programming language, but it's just kind of confusing in terms of syntax and um, 
I just think the user interface isn't as good as something like RStudio, uh, but that's just my opinion. And so um, go ahead, the two viewers we have, go ahead and leave in the chat, do you use any of these programs? If you're in a statistics major, um, just let me know if you use any of these and how much you use them. But, so now that I've talked about my major, um, I wanna talk a little bit about my job as a data analysis intern. And so I, I kind of break down my job into two areas. On one, one hand, I'm doing a lot of software testing. And so I'm not doing a lot of coding there. I'm doing more so the point and click programs, things like Tableau and SAS. And I'm testing those to make sure all the functions work, right? Uh, and then if they work, I just mark down, yes, it worked, here's how you do it. And you have to do that for like every single function that um, those programs have to offer. So that doesn't involve too much coding, but you do have to know these softwares in and out if you wanna go and through and practice everything that um, is available in those programs. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm doing some real data analysis and I'll get more into the dashboard side of things a little bit later on in this, but I'm building a dashboard using R. And so to do that, you need to know a lot of coding. Now, specifically in terms of coding, you need to know how to use the R Shiny package, which if you see my last video, I teach a little bit about how to use that. Um, but like in terms of like actual da data analysis in R for my job, 80 to 90% of it is data manipulation. So this is vastly different than what you're gonna do in school. A lot of what you're gonna do is already clean data and then you're just fitting models. So for intro to R, there was really very basic data manipulation just so we knew how to do it. But then when we had an actual project, the data was already clean for us. Same thing in ANOVA and regression, the professors just gave us data sets. We would fit our ANOVA model, we do our analysis and we do a project on that. Or we'd fit our regression model and we'd do our analysis and we'd do a project on that. But the data was always clean. Now this changed, like I said, in my machine learning course where we had a huge focus on data manipulation. Um, but in job, 80 to 90% of your, of your work is going to be data manipulation, at least from my experience. So data manipulation is one of the most ex important skills that you're gonna need to learn as a data analyst or a data scientist. Now, I know sometimes in job, I've heard that sometimes this will be outsourced to another team or another worker. Um, if you're like, an upper level data scientist maybe, you're gonna be more focused on fitting models. But I think early on in your career, you're really gonna be focused on data manipulation. So I think that's probably the most important skill when it comes to coding, using something like R or Python. You really need to know your data manipulation. And so with that being said, you're gonna have, the rest of your time is split in between kind of the stuff that I consider the sexy stuff, right? So model fitting, uh, model refining, doing those reports that, and, the, and that actual analysis that you want to be doing. So it's kind of unfortunate that, you know, you're really excited about a job in data and 80 to 90 percent of your time is going to be data cleaning. But it's so vital because without that, your models are going to be useless. You really can't refine a model on bad data and you can't make visualizations on bad data. So you can't do all the fun stuff without doing the actual work of data manipulation, right? And so in your job, coding is going to require a lot. You're going to, you're going to require coding a lot. And so I have a question in the chat, is R good enough in the job market? Um, so I have an opinion about that. Um, I'm gonna tell you that from my experience, big companies, they do use R, but they're also gonna have teams where they use something like Python, and then they're gonna have you know, less coding experience teams where they're using things like Tableau, or they're using things like SAS or Power BI. And for those programs, you're gonna be doing a lot more pointing and clicking. However, I have been searching through the job market quite a bit uh, being a senior. And I have a great internship now, and I think I'm gonna get a full-time from it. But um, I'm on a team where we use R, and I'm in a big company. And I've seen plenty of job postings that want experience in R, 
but a lot of them will say that they want experience in R, Python, um, and then they'll usually leave it at those and say like experience in related programs is a plus. So I think that knowing R is good enough, but you're going to really want to learn something like Python as well. So did that answer your question? Um, now, like I said earlier, I think that R and Py something like R and Python have a lot of crossover. So learning one is, is not too far from learning the other. I think if you take like a, or watch maybe like a three hour lecture on this, there's plenty on YouTube that are great. That's how I did a lot of my learning. Um, you, can, you can learn a lot from those, especially if you already know one or the other. Um, so if you haven't already, I'm gonna get into actually dashboard building, which is another important part. Um, but my last video, it's like a 40 minute long video, I make a R shiny dashboard. And in that description, I link to my newsletter. So if you join that, there's also the link in this um, live stream as well. But in my newsletter, I was talking about building a dashboard. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more right now. But dashboard building is super, super important if you're gonna work in data. And I'm gonna explain why, right? So um, like I was talking about before with my classes, you're gonna do your analysis and um, usually you're gonna get a clean data set. You're gonna do your analysis. Uh, you'll do all your data manipulation. Then you'll fit your model. You'll refine your model. Maybe you'll do some exploratory data analysis before that. And then finally, you'll write up your report with your findings. This is a very, very time consuming process. And if you're gonna be working in you know, a big company where things already move slow, they're gonna want a way that you can do this without knowing a lot about statistics and without knowing a lot about programming. So part of my job is, like I said, building a dashboard in R. And with this, it makes it so much easier for other teams to do some of the similar data analysis that you're doing. So what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna clean your data and then you build your dashboard around that. So there's probably some key performance indicators uh, and a key performance indicator is just kind of what the management wants to see. Like, um, so say if you're in a sales company, you want to track sales over time. Now you may have all this data on customers and what they purchase and when they purchase and how much they purchase, but it's not going to be a, a beautiful data set, especially if you're collecting a lot of data and it's kind of automated and you don't have somebody that's already cleaning that data for you when you get it. So you're going to have to take on a lot of that work of data manipulation. And after you do your data manipulation and you've, Kind of make a dashboard around that so um, like i said you're going to do a lot of exploratory data analysis in your statistics major but when you get into your job people aren't going to want to do that every time they want to go report right so you might have a, a repository of data that you're going to always be using and you kind of want to track this month over month so upstream so up here you're going to have the data source and how it's collected and from there you, you're probably gonna have a data engineer that kind of makes new categorical variables or they're going to refine some of the data so that um, columns are cleaned when somebody like a data analyst gets it. And when that data analyst gets it, they're going to build a dashboard around that, around that data and you're going to track those key performance indicators by time. And so it's not gonna necessarily be by time so in my case, I'm looking at a few of our key performance indicators around stuff other than sales, but um, you're gonna have somebody like a data analyst build this dashboard and then other people who want access to that information, so stakeholders or managers, they can just go into that dashboard and easily look at what those key performance indicators are and whether or not the company is reaching their goals. And so this is opposed to how it used to be or how you do it in school. How you do it in school is you do this step every single project. So you get your data, you manipulate your data, you do your exploratory data analysis, you explore further from that exploratory data analysis and try to figure out how those key performance indicators or how those response variables are acting. Then you fit your model, refine your model, write your report. So the dashboard takes away a lot of those steps. It takes away data manipulation. 
It takes away exploratory data analysis because you can do that all within the dashboard. And then you can refine that data set, especially in a dashboard, you're gonna have filters and you're gonna probably want filters and you're gonna probably want plenty of filters. So let's say for sales, um, we're gonna go back to that example. For sales, you wanna look at you know, customers in New York City. So you can refine your data set to filter that, only look at customers that are from New York City. And maybe you only wanna look at the past three months instead of um, the entire history of those customers. So you refine your data set and put, plug in your filter. It might be a drop down or it might be a date selection uh, tool. Whatever program you're using is going to have a lot of different options in this. But you can filter that data set by only the last three months and customers in New York City. And then you can track sales there. And maybe you ran a specific ad campaign um, two months ago and you want to see kind of how that affected sales for the customers in New York City over the past three months. And so you can do that, do that filtering and you would have a data visualization that shows sales over time. And after you do that filtering, it'll show only the customers in New York City the past three months. And what you would probably want to see if you were on this team is when you ran that ad campaign, sales shot up and you would hope maybe they stayed up because people uh, start talking and they introduce new customers to your, to your company, that kind of thing. So dashboarding is an extremely valuable tool. And if you're going to work in data, I really think you should learn how to do it, which is exactly why I'm making a little bit of a video series on my channel now where you're learning how to build a dashboard in R. And now as far as programs that you're want to, going to want to learn this in, I mean, I love R. So, and I'm a little bit biased in saying that I think you should use um, the video series that I'm going to be doing to learn it. But there's so many resources out there on R Shiny. But there's even more on Dashplotly, which is a Python uh, package for building dashboards. I've also used that in the past in one of my past jobs. Um, so that's another super important tool that you want to learn. Um, out of those two, those are kind of the coding intensive ones. But the point, more point and click stuff is great for like simple visualizations and simple dashboards. So things like Tableau, Power BI, SAS Bio. I think those are great in terms of um, kind of quick analysis tools and quick dashboarding tools, but they're not so great when you have huge amounts of data, which um, that's kind of the trend that we're seeing is companies are using huge amounts of data. And if you're going to be working at a big company, they're probably going to be using something like R or Python. Um, and then I'm sure there's other programs that I don't even know of that are even more pow powerful than those. But um, that's just my opinion. So. Anybody here ever build the dashboard or would like to learn how to build a dashboard? Let me know in the chat. I've been talking too much. You guys need to need to leave some comments or questions. All right, like I said, anyways, I wrote about building dashboards um, in my newsletter and you don't even have to subscribe, but, but the link is down below. You can go to my the website and see some of the, um, I've wrote two articles so far on there, so you can see those. If you feel like subscribing, go ahead. There's a button right there. You just plug in your email and it'll go to your um, inbox. And if you wanna make sure that you're updated every time you get one of those newsletters, you just wanna mark that as important and move it to your regular inbox. Um, but that is in the description of the live stream. So if you're interested, go ahead and uh, click on that. Because I do go in a little bit more detail in that, in that newsletter about dashboards. Um, I also leave a few links to some resources that I use when I was learning. So I have a link for R Shiny. Um, it's called Mastering R Shiny. And it's written by, I believe his name is Hadley Wickham. But he's a great resource on anything R. He's so knowledgeable when it comes to it. I follow him on Twitter. He's just awesome. Um, and then I also have a, I have a link in there on a YouTube channel that I learned Dashplotly. So the Python package I was talking about, he's super valuable as well. So I'll leave that. Um, that's in the newsletter as well. And afterwards, I might even post that in the recording of this live stream. Uh, I'll put that in the description as well. And then if you want to learn something like Tableau or um, building a dashboard in Excel or Power BI, unfortunately, those programs are very expensive. 
I think there might be some free versions, so I would do some looking into that if you want to just kind of get a basic idea. Excuse me, but um, ooh, that energy drink got me burping. Um, but I'll leave those resources in the description, and they are in that newsletter as well. Uh, is there any questions about dashboarding, though? Because I think it's so important, and I, I hope I did it justice in that little rant I just did. Um, I'm actually going to pull up the newsletter now and see if there's anything else I want to mention. Yeah, I guess it's important to mention also that I just, I see this trend a lot because I've seen job postings now for data an analysts and data scientists, and they want to see this dashboarding skill in your resume. I think it's super, super important, especially if you're going to be graduating from with a statistics degree, you know, in the next few years, you really want to take the time to learn that in the meantime, because it's so valuable because um, companies themselves, there's a lot of meetings, especially with big companies. There's so many meetings. And I've experienced it where somebody's just going through a presentation and presenting their findings. It's never as exciting as when you find it yourself. Um, so if you're in a dashboard and you're using that and you, know, you can kind of explore data, filter by exactly the population that you want to see and uh, do some exploratory data analysis there, it's so much more valuable than you know going through a boring 30-minute uh, long presentation about your findings. Um, it's just because it's so quick and it's so easy for somebody that doesn't have a lot of coding experience or a lot of data experience. Um, Cause then you can kind of narrow down where, by what you want to see. And um, every team is going to have a different metric that they're tracking or a different um, population that they're interested in. So seriously, I can't stress enough how important it is to learn these dashboarding skills. But um, with that out of the way, with the dashboarding stuff out of the way, I do want to spend some time talking about AI because I'm super interested in AI and the trends that I think are going on are super important to talk about and consider uh, with ethics and, you know, with the, the trends being that AI is beginning to start making images that look like an artist painted them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the advancements that have already happened in the past few weeks. Um, I think it's just super exciting, but it's also a little bit scary. So we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to change the view over here and um, we can take a look. All right. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is something that just came out today. I just got an email about this today um, and it's Meta's new text to video AI generator. If you've seen what Dolly 2 looks like for images, this one is videos. So you can see a little, a little teaser here of what that means. So here's a sample gener or sample video generated by Meta or Meta or Facebook or whatever you want to call it, um, and this is their new text to video model. So the the prompt into this one was a teddy bear painting a portrait, and now you can kind of tell this isn't perfect. You can see the foot on the painting it looks a little weird. The shadow looks a little strange, but this is quite an advanced adva advancement over even just the image generation stuff that we've seen from Dolly too just recently. And I'm sure Meta has been working on this for a while. I know they have a lot of things going on with AI and the metaverse, but I think this is super interesting. So we're just going to run through this article and talk a little bit about it. And I want to see what you guys think. So um, here they're saying this is from The Verge, but they're saying AI text to image generators have been making headlines in recent months, but researchers are already moving on to the next frontier, AI text to video generators. generators. So this was from Meta, and I'm sure other people are working on this, but I just think it's so interesting because it's so hard to fathom that this is even a possibility right now. But, I mean, there's plenty of smart people working on this, I'm sure, and it's just super interesting. But 
think about what this what this would mean for video editors and creatives and um, you know people who uh, graphic designers and video designers it's it's insane <laughs> honestly um, and if this is what they can create now just imagine what they can create in a couple years right so let's just keep going with this video but I'm really interested to see what Meta wants to do with this in the future, you know? So here, here's what Meta says about it in a blog post. Generative AI research is pushing creative expression forward by giving people tools to quickly and easily create new content. So it sounds like the trend is they want people to be able to maybe make a Facebook post and turn that into a video in seconds, which if you think about it, it's insane because the retention on something like a video is so much higher than that of something like a tweet or just a Facebook text post, right? And so now everybody might have access to this where they just make a post and then they include an AI generated video in it. And it's, I, I can see why they're doing it because I'm sure Facebook just wants that retention. They want people to stay on their website and stay on Instagram and stay on Facebook. But it's kind of a scary world because if everybody has access to that, we're just going to be flooded with it. And I, I can see it being like a TikTok effect where, you know, just the world becomes obsessed with something like this. And I'm sure TikTok's working on it too, but they're saying with just a few words or lines of text, make a video can bring imagination to life and create one of the kind of videos full of vivid colors and landscapes. So imagine you're going through your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, and you're just seeing video after video like this one. Um, but you know, at that point, it's probably going to be even higher quality and it's going to look like they made it themselves. Just imagine how much time you could spend and because it's so interesting. It's so amazing to see something like this. Uh, imagine how long that would take somebody, you know, a couple of years ago without an eye to make that video, even with this quality. And it would take even longer to make it much better quality. Um, I just think it's crazy. So yeah, this video just came out or this um, article just came out yesterday. So this is a brand new thing from Meta. So let's see what they have to say more about this, what Mark Zuckerberg said about it. He says it's amazing progress, and it's much harder to generate video than photos because beyond correctly generating each pixel, the system also has to predict how that'll change over time. But I mean, you can see from just that example that it's already pretty advanced. You know, they, I'm sure they're, they're, they need advancement because it's not perfect, but if they already have that, I feel like it's not a long shot or it's not gonna be a long time before they improve that even more and um, it's even better. And of course, so as of now, there's no audio to those videos, but I'm sure that's something they're working on and something they are wanting to do. Um, but let's just go through a few more examples and I wanna hear what you guys think about, about what's going on in AI. So here's a prompt, a young couple walking in heavy rain. So this is made by the AI generation. And you can see it's kind of spotty, it's kind of, you know, it's grainy, but if you just saw this, tell me that you wouldn't think that it could be real. You know, maybe it's taken on a crappy camera or something. There's no audio, of course, but it really looks like a young couple walking in heavy rain. And now here's another one. This one's a little bit more, you know, fantasy, but it's uh, unicorns running along a beach. And so they're kind of running in slow motion. Their manes are flowing. They're kicking up sand. It's pretty crazy. And then of course the teddy bear painting a portrait. I'll show that again. But I think it's just crazy. Because it looks it looks real. I mean it, it does. Even now, even though there's some imperfections, it does it looks pretty real. Now here they talk about some issues that could come up with this, and it is scary because you could you could see how this could be used for good, but you can also definitely see some negative use cases of this. Uh, we've already seen stuff with deep fakes kind of being a problem and being a worry for the future. This only makes that worse because imagine somebody types in something you know a prompt that um, 
could potentially be bad, right? A, a potentially negative and harmful fake news story about somebody. Uh, it's kind of scary, but I'm sure they've also considered that and they're going to try to, you know, hopefully make that so that it's not an issue in the future. But I, I guarantee that there's going to be some bad actors that misuse this kind of technology, right? But I mean, even they said they want to be thoughtful about how we build new generative AI systems like this. Um, and it plans to release a demo of the system, but does not say when or how access to the model might be limited. Now, I hope they extremely careful and they vet the people that they're going to give access to this. Because like I said, I'm sure there's bad actors that are going to want to use this technology, right? And here's some different... Um, different companies and um, other people that are working on similar projects. So a group of researchers from, I'm going to absolutely butcher this pronunciation, but Tsinghua University and the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence released their own text to video model named Cog Video. And it says here, this is the only other publicly available text to video model. And so here's an example from the Cog Video from the, those researchers in Beijing. So let's see how this compares to the meta version. So clownfish swimming through a coral reef. Now this one looks a little bit more cartoonish, but it's still so cool. And imagine this, because like, even a, a movie company could use something like this, and they have to, they don't have to hire all those animators, they just have to have people that are writing the text, and you know, kind of making an interesting story and interesting settings for their story. Now I'm not sure, it says these are meta AI, so this might be still the Facebook one. You can watch the sample output for cog video here. Here, let's just open. So that's the clownfish. Let's see what's going on here. I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. You just can't be great. Well, yeah, we'll get off that. So here's the um, cog video text to video AI generator. So these ones kind of look like photos meshed together almost. I would say the metas is a little bit more advanced, but this is from May, so they might have made some more advancements since then. So right here, I got Nikita. You can see that the image is kind of a little bit spotty on this one. This is really loud for me. I, don't, I hope it's not loud for you guys as well. Um, but let's see some more examples of metas text to video generator. So a dog wearing a superhero outfit, red cape flying through the sky. <laughs> that was just kind of funny. It doesn't look great, but it is funny. And a robot dancing in Times Square. You see the people in the, in the background moving kind of odd. They're all moving at like the same pace. But that, you can't tell me that this doesn't look like, almost like an advertisement for something, right? And so here's kind of a little bit more about how that works. Meta's researchers note that Make a Video is training on pairs of images and captions, as well as unlabeled video footage. So it sounds like they're taking unlabeled video footage and kind of, that's kind of the idea. And they're taking images and kind of matching that all into the video. Um, it's really interesting stuff. So that's a little bit about Meta's text to video. Um, AI generator, and let's see a little bit more about what I wanted to talk about. So this is back to Dolly 2, which um, if you've read anything about Dolly 2, it's a very interesting, it's similar, it's the text to image generator, it's not the text to video generator, um, but apparently Dolly 2 has made this a little bit more accessible to people online. So OpenAI, the makers of Dolly 2, said Wednesday that it's removing the waitlist, but it's stepping into a realm that's mired in controversy, right? So what, what does that mean? Really, all this article is telling us is that Dolly 2 is now a little bit more open, and let's see a little bit about how much more open it is. So before this, they say that they've already had 1.5 users creating more than 2 million AI-generated images a day. That's a ton. That's a lot of traffic for Dolly 2, which is interesting because, I mean, in my space, of, of course, I'm learning about this and trying to keep up on it.
but this is kind of going more public um, to people that aren't even interested in you know, building AI or being on a data science or machine learning team one day. It's kind of going public, and I think that's why a little bit of confusion and um, rage has gone into this. And a lot of the talk is around you know, what this means for creators and what this means for people who are um, creative in nature, so graphic designers and video editors. Um, I feel like the worry is that it's kind of going to reduce the need for these types of people. But from what we've seen so far, I mean, it's not going to take anybody's job because there's still imperfections in it, but it's getting, in my opinion, a little bit dangerously close to what a human can do. Let's read a little bit more about what Dolly said, making this, public, this API a little bit more public. So if you go to the OpenAI website for Dolly, still ask users to sign up for a wait list as of the time of reporting, but there's now a sign up page. In an email statement, OpenAI said that from the start, they've taken on an iterative deployment approach to responsibly scale Dolly, which has helped us discover ways it can be used as a powerful creative tool. So what I'm gonna guess they're doing is they're going to try to make some money off this, and I think they definitely can because I feel like the demand for this type of thing is going to be through the roof, right? But it says here, users who sign up get 50 free credits to create images during the first month, and then 15 free credits every month after that. I'm assuming just the sign up page, like you're gonna add some type of payment. I don't know how much that's gonna be. Maybe they'll explain it a little bit more in the uh, later parts of this article, but they're gonna have unlimited access to these gen AI generated images. I feel like they can just iteratively do this and get exactly what they want out of it. And I think that's going to be super interesting, but also a little bit scary. So I'm interested to see what type of companies are going to be the first to sign up for this kind of thing. I don't think I can hear there's an ice cream truck outside my, uh, outside my apartment right now. I was wondering what that music was. But um, so OpenAI's Dolly was first revealed in April. And by now, they're try probably trying to make this more of a production deployment rather than just kind of testing it with the public. And I guess Dolly was named after Disney Pixar's Wally, which is kind of an interesting thing, which I did not know. Um, and these seem like, OpenAI's Dolly kind of seems like the first to go public like this um, with an AI generated image tool. But it's super interesting. Uh, let me know what you guys think Think about Dolly. And do you think it's, do you think it's gonna pose a threat to creative people? I just see a question in here, Lucky MBA. I'm a sophomore economics major. Is it too late to add on stat or CS as a major? Um, so would you be switching from your economics major or getting a double major in stats or CS with economics? I mean, in my opinion, I think that, I don't think it's too late to add on, but it might be too late to do a double major and finish your economics major or and a stats or CS major as well. Uh, within the next two or three years. Um, but with that being said, I got into statistics my junior year. I did end up having to go an extra semester. I'm in an extra semester right now. Um, but I don't think it's too late to add on stats or CS as maybe a minor or switching completely, especially if you already have some of the math out of the way. Um, because for me, that was kind of the biggest problem when I switched to stats. I was behind math, so I had to go an extra semester. So were you thinking about switching to that major or were you gonna do that in addition to economics? Here, let's go let's go into kind of the uh, controversy around AI and uh, lucky MBA just leave it in the comments if you have any um, additional questions on that You can see if you're reading here that there are some 
problems that and th these companies need to factor that in when they're generating these text to image or text to video generators. Um, you know, they have to have some kind of systems in place that can protect against bad content like that um, and protect against bad, you know, fake content as far as people saying things that they didn't say or images that make people look like they're doing something that they, they never did, right? Now, that's obvious, I feel like, um, but still, like I said earlier, I think there's going to be some bad actors um, in this space, and I, I hope that that doesn't happen, and I hope that these companies do this responsibly, but we're going to have to wait and see. And lucky MBA, you said you wanted to get into data analytics, just not sure what to do if I'm a third semester econ major. I mean, I think, so if you want to be a data analyst um, in an economics realm, I think majoring in economics and minoring in statistics is a great way to do it. My opinion on computer science, though, is that you're not going to learn the skills to be a data analyst. You're going to have to still do the stuff on your own. I think statistics is much what a data analyst does. And that's coming from somebody who majored in statistics and is a data analyst intern right now. Um, so that's just my opinion, but I don't think that computer science is going to teach you the same level of skills there. Now, computer science is going to be great if you want to learn the theory behind, you know, coding and behind theory. Um, but that's just my opinion. So I think a minor is going to be... A much better idea. So Don Miss, you said I dropped Mech E for stat at the end of my sophomore year and will graduate on time. If you already have taken Calc one through three, or if you could take Calc three over the summer, you'll probably graduate on time. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, like I said earlier, it has a lot to do with the math that you've taken and the classes that you've taken. So, my opinion overall. If you want to get into data analytics, analytics, I think statistics is the best option or math. Um, but you're definitely going to want some grounding in statistics where you're actually working. Because my experience working in statistics in a in college, um, you're going to learn a lot of programs. You're going to learn R. You're going to learn SATs. You might have to learn some Python. You'll probably use Tableau. Um, another great option, though, if you want to go kind of the non-coding route or the non, you know, like statistical background route is MIS, so Management Information Systems, or anything grounded in information systems. Um, as a data analyst, you learn a lot, a lot about how to use Tableau as a data analyst, and um, that's my minor. So I'm an applied statistics major with a minor in information systems, and through information systems, I've learned a lot about, like I said, Excel and Tableau. I think it's super valuable if you just want to kind of learn how to use those tools and you can kind of set yourself up to be in the data analytics space. But personally, I think st the statistical background is just as important, um, especially if you kind of have, you know, the goal of moving on even further from there. So here's another article from the LA Times on Dolly and kind of what, you know, the future can hold for this. So the title of the article is How AI Generated Art is Changing the Concept of Art Itself. And I, I don't know if you guys have seen the news, but there's been people entering AI generated images into art contests. Um, and the ethics behind that, I feel like it's kind of spotty because it's such a new, a new thing, a new realm. It's hard to discuss these kinds of things because these things are changing every single day. Um, there's going to be new safeguards put in place. And I feel like for an art contest, obviously, I don't think AI-generated art should be in it, right? Because what is that doing? It's, it's testing how good the AI-generated art is, um, which, I mean, it's just a testament to what kind of program you're using. And if you have access to a much better program than other people, then obviously your art's going to do better. Um, but 
when you're competing against people who made art by hand. I it's not it's not a fair comparison. Um, but that's that's up to debate, I guess, because um, as AI image generation and video generation come further along, it's just going to only be more and more common to see these things in our daily life. And so it's going to have to be, you know, a conversation that goes on. Um, but, you know, that's just kind of where things are heading. But uh, lucky MBA. So as a data analyst intern, I kind of talked about this earlier in the live stream, so maybe you could go back. But um, as a data analyst intern, my time's kind of split up 50-50 between two things. Uh, I do some data anal ana analytics. I do some uh, software testing as well. So my time is split between those two things. Um, I definitely enjoy the data an analysis a lot more, but uh, the software testing is just as important, in my opinion, um, as far as like a company level wide issue goes but personally the data analytics is so much more fun to me um, but you have to be kind of like a naturally data inquisitive person so like you have to be interested in data analytics and in order for you I think to see if you like it I think you should do a few self projects um, kind of follow along tutorials on YouTube and do a data analytics product project from start to finish figure out if you like that first before you even decide to try to change your major, because I think that can be made by changing your major if you don't have any experience in it. I kind of found it out as I was going through college too.